Just testing. Okay, there we go. Um, what I'm going to do now is try to make sure I get this set up properly. I think I found the error of my ways. Got to make sure I choose a file. There it is. And I'm going to try this again. All right, I'm going to go to scale mode because at least according to this, I'm able to, there it goes. I just didn't want things to look so small that you guys couldn't read it. So as I mentioned in my previous attempts, hopefully this is a simple A to Z of getting your Slackware system set up. If you're looking to venture into Slackware Linux, I'm doing this from within a virtual box so my system doesn't fall apart. Not saying that it will, I don't think I've done anything to the point where it will do that. Either way, you're seeing here, <laughs> figured out that I needed to download the Slackware ISO. So, very simple, just hit enter and just type in root from here. Uh, in my trial and error, that's a thing you'll find out in the Linux world. Sometimes it'll come down to a bit of that. A lot of it, sometimes not too much, but you'll find out what works and what I'm finding out is I'm going to stick with FDIS for the moment. And I'm going to go into, because I believe I had done a previous attempt to install. And let's see. Aha. Uh -huh. I have my partition set up. So I can actually, well, let me do this. I will demonstrate how to set up the partitions because I think that view that view wasn't exactly the best so I'm gonna try that I'm gonna delete all the partitions I set up previously just because the text might, might will very likely have been ineligible or illegible no, couldn't see it so I'm gonna write the rewriting of that writing to the table, the deletion of my partitions. Now I'm going to go in and use the up arrow key. You'll find that those who have used command prompt or still use command prompt even in this day and age. Up and down arrows, cycle through commands. I'm going to repeat this. I'm going to create a new one. It's going to be a primary. It's going to be number one. And I like the idea that it gives you the default numbering. I'm going to stick with the default beginning. And because of the way I set up my virtual box, I'm going to set up a, an EFI partition. And the nice thing about that customization of the sizing, like you don't have to worry about the second half. You can just hit enter. And now you specify the sector based on the size amount you're going to put. I'm putting in 16 megabytes, as you can see from the KMGTP. You just got to put the plus. Then you're going to put the appropriate ending. So if you want it kilobytes, K, megabytes, M, gigabytes, G, terabytes, T, and then I think it's petabytes, P, and I'm just going to hit enter. Yes, I'm going to remove the signature. Okay. I'm going to type. And I'm going to list it. EFI is going to be EF, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to write. Next, so I'm going to up arrow. I'm going to create a new partition. P, use number two, why not? First sector, I just have to hit enter. And then, of course, the last sector will be specified by how big of a drive I want. I'm going to go. 8 gigabytes, this is going to be for my swap. And again, if we want, we're going to specify the type, uh, the partition number we want to change the type for. And I'm going to list. And I'm going to go 82. That's my Linux swap. I'm going to put new, P, and this is going to be 3. Start sector there. And of course, I'm just going to go with the last. I'm just going to hit enter again because I want to use the rest of it. 
Okay, looks like I've got everything. I'm going to write the partition table, and then I would go to setup. And then here, very easy. I'm going to add my swap partition. Say, nope. Cool. And like I said, I'm going to use the rest of it, so I just have to hit select. If you have multiple drives, you can be creative where you're going to mount. For Mac users, you're already used to that terminology. Uh, Windows users may not, but mounting does take place. It's just very much behind the scenes. So I'm going to use the rest of this drive. So if you happen to have like three drives, you can choose where certain folders or where, uh, where you're going to put your drive. Because in Linux, Unix, the drives will be mounted onto folders. And when you go into a folder, they're going to tell how much free space that, that drive that has. So you could technically have multiple drives. You could either, you could say, you can mount a different drive to a different folder, depending on what you want to do with it. Kind of, kind of a little, I don't know how dangerous it would be, but it would be something where you might go cross-eyed or your mind get a little scrambled. So I'm going to hit enter. I'm going to format. I'm going to choose the standard X4. Depends on what, what kind of files you're going to store. If you're going to do archiving, you might benefit from using JFS. Uh, as you see, Ricer FS, uh, other things like that. Uh, and then I'm intrigued by, I'm just seeing this F2 FS, the flash friendly. Interesting, I'll have to look into that. And then XFS. So there's um, different types of file systems beyond what people have come to know within the Windows world. Uh, okay, so I'm just doing that. Yep. And... I'm going to install everything. You can see here the setup. This is basically the order it's going to go in. I'm going to go full because it only requires 15 plus gigabytes. So I'm hoping with what I'm going to demonstrate here, it's going to be sufficient space. Uh, and I'm just going to see what I can demonstrate after this. Uh, what your options may be, maybe some more installation walkthroughs, options, things like that. So what I'm installing right now, like I mentioned with the multi-lib video, that this is going to be a purely 64-bit system until I decide to enable multi-lib support. And the one thing I appreciate about this is this is very much a uh, Quick install compared to what you might have been accustomed to with Windows. In the old days, 30 to 45 minutes, maybe to an hour, maybe two. Uh, that would be the average amount of time an installation would take. Uh, this probably gets up and ready in about 20 minutes. Now, at least to Windows credits, depending on how you look at up the update process and the idea of updates in general, because I've known some updates to affect your system to some level, there's been plenty of pushback by end users when it comes to an update being installed, especially when it comes to automatic updates. And again, talking to my in my other videos about that, uh, the reasoning for preferring Linuxes or maybe to some degree Unix this idea of not pushing automatic updates. And of course, certain distributions may or may not have that option to automatically update your system, especially if you're one of those who want to be on the bleeding edge. And I was on that for a little bit of my Linux life, but I just need something that works. So it's just going by the letter, in this case, of how uh, Slackware, anyway, divides its sections of what's going to be installed. So right now, it looks like it's in the libraries. No, it's in, it's in the tools and applications. And depending on the 
And the thing about the desktop environments, it, give, it gives you even more in terms of applications you can, you can work with. Uh, because for most desktop environments, a lot of the apps can carry over to another desktop environment. Uh, let's see if I can minimize that a little bit. I'm going to use Alt F2 in my own environment. I'm going to sneak this out to my other monitor. Minimize this. I'm going to type in Thunar. Maybe File Manager. So Thunar is a file manager that's mainly found in the X... I think it's F... I'm going to just do a quick check here. I haven't really... I'm going to run Vivaldi. Let's see if I can... Yep. Oh, this is my wallet password, not my root user. Part of me wishes the character count not being shown as in, in the command prompt area or the terminal. Let me see if I can. I didn't get everything in there, so let's see. On that, I'm going to just do a quick search about XFCE, because I'm trying to make sure I get my, X, my acronyms right. Yep. XFCE, it's called the X-Free Cholesterol Environment. Yes, that's what it stands for. But Thunar is part of that. Uh, that that's part of the application bundle. So each desktop environment provides their own class of applications. Uh, for the K desktop, it's going to be Caligra. Got that and so forth. So I'm gonna show I'm gonna see what Thunar looks like from my perspective. Thunar is there we go. Thunar looks fine, you know, but the KDE, I'm gonna show you the KDE one here. Dolphin is the name of its file manager. So you can kind of see what it has what's available if you plug something in it, it gives you the options of mounting each detected device let's go back to the installation bit so it's looking it's moving on to the actual libraries programming libraries uh, these it's been I've been appreciative of Slackware's inclusion of a lot of these because depending on what you want to get, it's going to have to rely on each of these libraries because um, some applications will be built use, using a program like Ruby, uh, what they call CMake, uh, Python. Python's become popular uh, of, note, uh, of late. Uh, Simple C, uh, they often call it the GNU C compiler. But a lot of the programs you're going to grab, they're going to be built using different libraries and each library will, will kind of showcase on the back end what that looks like let me go and explode this so it's a little bit more visible Yeah, moving along. And, you know, some people want to be on the up-to-date kernel, but as I, I believe in other videos, I've mentioned that sometimes you don't need to update your kernel. Sometimes you can be good with the default kernel that's provided by Slackware. It just comes down to whether you're going to try to plug in a new device that may not be rec recognized by the 
bundled kernel, but Slackware has done a good job of providing an updated kernel. So I don't know what the most current kernel available is, but I do know Slackware will do what it can to provide a stable kernel, for, especially for those who just want an environment that works. And so right here, we're installing the KDE uh, desktop environment, and it does include uh, the X free cholesterol or XFCE along with very bare bones um, trying to think of um, the two sh the two in environments you provided um, there's um, black box and flux box and then window maker I believe it is those are very mi minimalistic looking shells because all you need to, all you're really looking for is you just need the program to launch but some people want that graphical aesthetic that makes the desktop environment enjoyable. Um, I haven't found a need with the newest KDE to make it look nicer or at least make my Linux environment a wannabe looking Mac OS 10. I've done that for kicks and Googles, but I'm on a, I have a MacBook for myself that I use. I thought Mac would be a good compromise because at least the big names are writing stuff for it that for it that they wouldn't write for Linux. Um, oh well. But more and more I'm finding finding ways anyway to kind of reduce my my reliance on Windows. Not that it's a Windows is a whole it's not that Windows is a wholly bad environment. It's just, I kind of prefer working Linux and yeah there are, are struggles you may run into if you really want to get in and learn how to maintain and add stuff but with what we're installing right now a lot of it is at your fingertips if you need to do some graphics editing or photo editing you've got a software there if you want to do some design work you've got plenty of software for that it's just a matter of Again, going back to this idea of baseline being a personal thing, personal uh, perspective about what your wants and needs are and whether or not a given application will fulfill that. If you need to go outside of the bundled stuff, you're not, you're not locked down and saying, no, can't do it. And so just showing how quickly this installation moves and then just the post in, post setup process which is just setting up your boot environment and all that so and one thing I do like about this is it does provide an idea of what comes with the soft what comes with the desktop environment about what what you have in terms of the um, suite of software like I haven't used Copete as, as you might have seen it I'm a VNC client interesting Krita I've used looks pretty cool So that's the one thing I do appreciate is that I don't I don't feel I don't I don't um, feel too chained. If I want to be able to if I want to run a command line based program, I can, and it's not going to disrupt my, uh, and it's not going to disrupt my graphical user interface interface and vice versa. Uh, if I want if I prefer like uh, M player. That's a popular uh, media player used in command in the command line, in conjunction with the GUI, of course, because you're if you're, especially if you're going to play video, but if you're going to just listen to audio, and you're and depending on what your listening patterns are like, you might be able to get away with that. Just play music in the background in your command line, and plays it just fine and 
It frees up resources. Now people can say, well, <laughs> Wes, uh, you've got a butt ton of RAM. I get it. But that butt, butt, ton, butt ton of RAM could be used for other applications. Probably something for something more intensive. You know, that kind of thing. I suppose for my next venture, my next video, I'm going to want to install Myth TV, especially with what's going on within the uh, SQL space. There has been a push to use what is known as Mariah or Maria DB. It, I don't know if it's a fork or spinoff, but um, that's been the default of choice. So while that's going on, I'm going to minimize this. Oh, more libraries? Okay. I'm going to go back and go back to my trusty site, Slack Builds. I'm going to type in the TV if number one it's still a thing and it. Oh. I wonder if it had to been removed from the... Oh, it has. Let's see why. Did they have to retire it? Did it move into a different direction? Myth TV release notes. Oh, it's been... With TV, it's been only oh with fixes. Okay. Let's see what they have. Yeah, these are like the big three or big numbers in terms of a. Uh, Linux distributions, they like the Ubuntu. Yep. I type in TV, what do I have for options? Rename my TV, Flinch. Interesting. Myth TV was my jam. I will have to do some loose research and capture this. Still moving along. Well, what I might end up doing is just sectioning this off into another video uh, because, you know, well, we'll see. I don't feel like I want to. I want to create a separate video just for the boot setup, but um, I'll probably do something within the environment. All right, let's go into this and do some. Do some sleuthing. Oh. So this goes back to my earlier videos about dependencies. So optional but recommended. I'm going to be interested to see if I could make use of it. 
This script is for Slackware, okay, and maybe outdated, okay. Let's see. Let's capture it. Yep, definitely a sleuth in time for me. Hope I'm also not losing track of time. Eh, still pretty young day, so to speak. Let's go ahead and make that look bigger. There it is. This is likely in the networking section of it. And again, I very much appreciate of each component being explained. You don't get that in a lot of the installation procedures, especially in Windows nowadays. I think they've really, they've really, I guess you can say streamlined the experience where they cut through a lot of the detail. Mac is kind of the same way. Just like, hey, where are you going to install it? And then, hey, it's done. <laughs> Again, that goes back to my mentality about why I appreciate the Linux distributions making you kind of learn and appreciate what you're putting into your system. Like you just saw in that old script about Myth TV, what it would require, what it depends on, and then optional dependencies to install. Um, so it's just that mentality of being able to see how a system comes together. That's my biggest takeaway in my time using Linux. Now, well, well, I don't think I've had a desire to be like some sort of Linux administrator, but sometimes, but in my downtime, I might look into that more fully just so that way I can build up my foundation because a foundation is one where you can stand on. Now I'll admit my foundation is not as big as other people's, especially those who've been using Slackware for decades upon decades upon decades. Now I'm willing to let my foundation grow, just building and building my understanding because a lot of my approach is very what you would call agile. I mean, I just get the answers, like I mentioned, get the answers to the questions I need, I need to ask. Uh, basically, if I run into a problem, do some sleuthing, find the solution, test it, and then, okay, good to go. <laughs> Previous video I tried to take didn't take, didn't seem like it. Took that long. Honestly, I haven't played with keyboard layouts. Um, again, it might come to my um, language video that I might put out. I'm just going to get my resources. It's going to be a comparison about language acquisition, particularly when it comes to reading and recognizing sounds and characters for a given language. So we'll see. I've, when I went to college, I did a year's worth of Mandarin and learned a certain romanization system known as Pinyin. But before that, there was a heavy use of what is called Bopo Mofo. Uh, particularly in Taiwan, uh, as I understand it. Come on. If you want to fast forward to the end, you're more than welcome to. I might end up doing that in the post-production. <laughs> Just because, yeah, it takes a bit. I'll probably do that, edit that, splice it out, get to the very end. Because, yeah, who wants to sit through this?
But I hope the explanations I'm providing will be of use. Um, and also just setting up the right mindset, especially when you go into or something new, you're not familiar with it. Well, Google's Noto fonts. Interesting. Getting to the end. Getting to the end. Get into the end, get into the end. Yep. Again, just explaining what you have available. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I've used GFTP and then this is the equivalent to Photoshop. It's also available for Windows. But <laughs> and there were some plugins available. I haven't looked into those in a while uh, that would make your GIMP experience as close to Photoshop as it can make it. At the end of the day, I'm looking to um, walk through a kernel update and recompilation as requested by Peaches TV 2621 and then go from there. And there will be sleuthing in terms of what hardware you want to run. That's the other thing about Linux is you're going to want to look at, I think Linux compatible is operational, so you can dig up any bit of hardware type, start with the type of hardware you want to use, and then see if it fits the bill, and they'll give you different grades of what will work and what will work best, especially. Yep, this is the XSCE as I researched. Um, basically, uh, what they provide in their bundle. So even whether you start with XFCE or KDE, you'll have those available. That's the one thing I appreciate is that you can have some overlap with some of the envi uh, environmental aesthetics. I'll probably show each environment you can get into in, in, in other videos, but I'm just highlighting what the process is going to be from start to finish, at least for Slackware, those who want to get into it and all that. You kind of see a lot of things available. You can see how little of a footprint they provide to a given system. That's here we go. We're almost there. There it goes. Yeah, getting to the end. And I was going to do this. Elilo is an upgrade to uh, from Lilo because of the use of UEFI. Uh, so that's what Elilo stand, uh, is meant for. Especially since I do have a UEFI, uh, EFI, UEFI, or UFI interface. So I'll just go ahead and install it. Install the boot mode order entry and that's been created. It's going to be up to you if you can say USB connected mouse or PS2, but based on my virtual ma uh, box settings, I'm going to leave it at that. Yep. And then I'm just going to put VBox. Yep. Say no. Yep. Yep. 
And these are the kind of uh, servers you can set up. Uh, Cups for me is useful because I do run my printer off a network. SQL, just in case I want to use something around that, like uh, my, a Myth TV if I find it. Like I said, it's going to require some sleuthing on my part. Samba, just in case I want to put together some... I'm going to look up Samba. There's one thing I want to learn. It's that. I, I've known about that for a while. Let's see if I've set up my cup server. I think I did. No, I haven't. No. Pacific time zone. I'm going to just bust it out like that. I'm going to be bold, use Mr. Elvis, <laughs> and I'm going to set my default to, and you can easily change this with a simple command of xwm config, I believe. I'm going to set my password to for my root user. Yep. I have to reboot the system, and I'm going to exit. Okay, I'll remove the installation disk. I'm gonna power off. That way I can change my boot order. Powering off. Going down. All right, I'm gonna probably create a separate video. All right, until next video, have a good one guys, fellow skeptics. Uh, this should be uploaded anytime soon.